Hello and welcome to another Google Plus Hangout. I am Scott Giorgini and I'm one of the hybrid heroes on discovermirrorless.com and also the creator and curator of mirrorlesscentral.com. And I am right now sitting with an eager group of photography enthusiasts here in Buffalo, New York. And we have the honor and privilege of a special guest joining us today. And she is a photo educator, she's a photo innovator, and she is also a hybrid here on Discover Mirrorless who is pioneering a new art of hybrid photography, the combination of photos, videos, audios, and graphics into a whole new beautiful art form. It's my privilege to welcome Marlene Helema. How are you doing, Marlene? I'm great. How are you, Scott? I'm excellent, and everybody here is very excited. I've been telling them you were going to be here all week, so everybody's, all right. you know, Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hello. Great to see you all, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> well, hold on a second. Oh, there they are. Hey. Yeah, we'll get a look around the room, nice. and there's people behind me, too. Wow, that's cool. Exactly. Okay, so I'm back. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do today is, again, we have people here who are from beginners to a little more experienced with their cameras, and we're all kind of learning the ropes of how to use the camera. And even myself, well, I come from a video background, and I'm trying to weave a little more photography in. Okay. So if you could show us some of the basics of how to use a camera, how to get the most out of it. You know, everybody's got those wonderful little mode dials on their cameras. Even if they don't have a dial, there's, it's going to be in your menu somewhere. Right. Um, you know, what is PASM? What do those do? And, and, and you're also really good at getting, you know, they call it shallow depth of field. Or what's that Japanese word for it? Bokeh. Bokeh, that's it. Yep. You know, how to get the blurry background, you know, and kind of like, the foreground, your, your subject is nice and clear, but the background isn't. So Marlene, you were an expert on sharing this knowledge with people, so I'll, I'll tell you what, I'm going to turn it over to you. I okay. know you have some stuff prepared for us. Yes, I have a little slideshow, and when I teach in the classroom, I the very first class, I give people like a thing about how to set up your digital camera, because here's the problem with digital cameras. Yes, they're simple, but they have way too many menus. And for the beginner, it's hard to navigate through those menus and what should I use first and, you know, which ones are the most important. So I actually could go through some of that presentation, if you don't mind, and start with that. And I do start with the mode dial first. Do you think that would work for everybody there? I think that would be wonderful. And if you don't mind, if anybody has a question, is it okay if Absolutely. they just interject? Yeah, just jump right in. And if I can't hear you, just say, wait a second, because I'm going to make sure that I can see you, Scott. So let me just uh, share my screen a second here. All righty. Of course, I have to move everything out of the way. Screen share. Okay. Are we there? All yep, right. yeah, we're there. We're there. Okay. Now I'll just keep my little sidebar of slides here. Is that going to be okay? So so not I can fly my all. way around. Okay. I think that should do it. Okay. So when you first uh, grab your camera, if you have a mode dial on the outside of the camera, um, you guys can grab your cameras now, and I'll just pretend that you know I can see you and you're watching your cameras. So now. Um, Canons and Nikons are slightly different and other brands as well. I know for the Nikons, you're going to, well, let's just start off with the green square of death, which is what I call it. So, uh, most mode dials have a full auto mode. And in that full auto mode, and usually some, the Canons have like a green square, and the Nikons, it says auto, and my Lumix, my Panasonic here is intelligent auto, and so basically, can you find the auto dial? Does everybody got that? So in that mode, in that mode, the camera basically makes most of the decisions for you. So the camera's going to choose your ISO. The camera's going to choose your white balance. And in some cases, the camera will even choose whether you need to use a flash or not. So you know, sometimes you take a picture, and it won't take the picture. And then all of a sudden, your flash pops up. Has that ever happened to anybody? Yep. And so what, what, the reason it wouldn't take the picture is because it's charging that flash and the, and the camera determines, wow, we're in a low light situation here. I've got to use the flash. So, the, so you know, the camera delays and then the flash charges and then finally you can take your picture. So, so Mark, could you really quickly explain ISO and white balance? Oh, sure. I was going to do that a little bit later, but I will. But ISO... Okay, you know, if it's in your presentation, we'll yeah. wait for that. That'll be okay, fine. Okay, that's cool. Um, so I'll just talk quickly about the mode dial, and then we're going to go right into ISO, white balance, and, and all that fun stuff. So, awesome. 
Um, in um, so the next mode is just just do a quick sort of tour of the mode dial. The next mode is program mode. So and this is like automatic. It's still automatic, but it's what we call flexible. So the camera will select the f-stop and shutter speed. So the camera will determine the exposure, and you do the rest. So in this mode, you you set the ISO and you can set the white balance and you can choose if you want to use the flash in program mode. So that's called P on the dial, mm -hmm. and hopefully this isn't too simple for everybody. And the next one, did everybody find that, hopefully? And if it's not on the outside of your dial, it will be on the inside of your camera menu somewhere. Now, I, I didn't start with the first slide I usually start with, which is read your camera manual. And everybody groans, you know, and I, <laughs> and I say, read the camera manual on an as-needed basis. So read what you need to know in that camera manual. You don't have to read every single page, but if you can't find like the shutter priority button or whatever, then you can go to the manual and look up the mode dial and, and you'll find it. So, and it's always a good idea to look for a Japanese translator as well. Yes, because sometimes okay. they, they, don't, uh, they don't give the best translations of the mode exactly. dials. So the next uh, sh um, symbol on the mode dial is, is shutter priority. Now, if you have a Canon, it's going to be labeled TV, which is, stands for time value. And if you have a Nikon, it'll be an S. And if you have a Panasonic, it'll be an S. And I think Sony is also S. I'm not sure how many camera brand names you got in there. But it's either S or TV. It's one or the other. OK. OK, so that's shutter priority. Now, in this mode, you choose the shutter speed. And the camera will determine the correct aperture or f-stop. And it's still based on that same automatic metering that program mode is. So it's, it's identical. And then the next mode on the mode dial is aperture priority, which basically means you select the f-stop you want to shoot with, and the camera determines the correct shutter speed. Let me just make my slide. And the f-stop is the lens opening. Yes, the lens opening. So okay. the camera, the camera basically has two controls for exposure: the shutter speed, which controls the time, and the aperture, which controls the lens opening. And think of the aperture like the pupil in your eye. So when you're in low light, the aperture, your pupil, goes large. And in bright sunshine, your pupil will go small. So when you are in a low light situation with your camera, you can, you can add some light by opening up the aperture, and that will add light to your picture. And you can also add time, and that would be adding time on the shutter speed. All right, so is everybody with me, or is that, should I? Yeah, we get that. Okay. We're cool? Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to start talking about those important menus, okay? so. There's like a hundred bazillion things you can set on your camera, right? And, but I say for beginners, you really should only start with four things. And I'm going to go over each one in detail. The file size, the file quality, the white balance, and the ISO. So I'll try to whiz through these. And is this too simple? Are we we're good so far? Oh, we're, good. we're digging okay. it. Okay, they're digging this. Okay, yeah. so so uh, I always say to people, size matters. Now, why why does size matter? Well, because the file size, what I say is begin with the end in mind. You don't have to take every picture you take at your largest file size. Because basically, sometimes all you want to do is email those photos to your friends, or put them on Facebook, or put them in a presentation like this one. So it's good to know the size you need ahead of time before you set it in your camera. Now here's some examples. If you're on a holiday and you're going to the Grand Canyon, you bet you want that 18 megapixel file size because you might be blowing up that photo really large. But if it's if you're at if you're on a say a, a if you're at a party or a dinner party and you're taking shots of people at the table or an event, you don't have to have all those photos at 18 megapixels. You can choose what I call a medium or small size, you know, 3 megapixels, 4 megapixels, good enough to put on a website, and even then, those are really big. So, and I'm going to go over what megapixels and all that means. So, what pixel, megapixels really means is mega equals millions. And if you go into your size menu, which we'll just do in a second, uh, you multiply the width times the height of your sensor. And I have a sensor in a, in a small Canon G9 point-and-shoot camera. And if I open up my biggest file size, it's 4,000 by 3,000 pixels. 
And when you multiply 4,000 by 3,000, you get 12 million. And 12 million equals 12 megapixels. And that's where the megapixels comes from, if anyone cares to know. So if you go into your menu in your camera, OK? So go find your size menu. And this might take a second for everybody. It'll, and it, if you have a Canon, it might be in the quality menu, OK? Canons call it quality. It'll be image quality, picture quality, picture size. You definitely want to go into the size. So does everybody have that? Have, do you notice that there's different sizes of files that you can choose? Mm -hmm. Yeah? OK, and how's, how are the rest of the students doing there? You guys all up to speed? Yep. Yeah. We all okay, got so, it. Great. So if you need, it, so if it's just everyday pictures, what I call having the camera in the ready to go mode, you know, the dog does a trick or the kid's doing something funny, you know, uh, I always just choose it, leave it in a medium size. And medium is good for, you know, just about anything. You can print a decent file from it, etc. If it's, like I said, if you're at the Grand Canyon and you have those killer shots, which you think, wow, I really think I'm going to blow these up big, then you might choose a large file size. And it'll tell you, most cameras give you the actual pixel dimensions of that file when you're in that menu. So anything 5, point, you know, five megapixels around there, 4, 5, or 6 is good for everyday photos, what I call. And that way you save space on your memory card and stuff as well. Now just for comparison's sake, the photos that are in this presentation are really small. They're only 900 by 600 pixels. So even if you do PowerPoint shows for work or for school and stuff, you don't need those, even those 5 megapixel files. They're going to be way too big for a presentation. So you will probably have to resize those smaller. Okay. okay. So, so basically, you don't necessarily, the point is you don't need the biggest file size all the time. Well, especially if you're showing pictures off on, say, like your iPad or your iPhone exactly. or the Internet, they're yeah. usually pretty small. Yes. Okay. Okay, next I'm going to talk about quality, okay, image quality. And most people, when they start out, they shoot JPEGs. And JPEGs take up less space because they are compressed. Now, cameras shoot two types of files commonly and sometimes a third type. So cameras will shoot JPEGs, they'll shoot RAW files, and some digital cameras shoot what we call TIFF files. But I'm not going to talk about those today. I'm just going to talk mostly about JPEGs and RAW. Now, JPEGs... With JPEGs, you can actually choose the quality of that JPEG. Now, you can have really high-quality JPEGs and really low-quality JPEGs. I, would, I always tell people, never, ever, always, rather, always use the best-quality JPEG. And here's why. When you have JPEG files, they throw out information. And memory is cheap now. Memory cards are cheap. When digital, you know, when I started digital photography, like memory cards cost more than the camera or just about as much. But if you need to save space on your card, just pick a smaller file size. It's better to have a smaller file size at better quality than a low quality JPEG that's big. You can do more with a better quality JPEG. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. So when you, uh, when you see your menu that says quality, you want to choose the best one. Now here's some, every camera calls them differently. Some cameras call it normal, fine, super fine, basic, normal, fine, good, better, best. And Canons, they have a crazy thing. They have symbols. So with a Canon, you have like this thing that looks like a piece of pie and it, or, a, or some steps, right? So the steps is low quality and the the round one is what we might call super fine. Okay, does that make sense? So you always want, the moral of the story, always put it on the best quality when you're shooting JPEGs. Now some cameras also have the ability, or most of them do if they shoot RAW files, you might be able to shoot a JPEG plus a RAW together. So does, does everybody, does anyone have that on their dial? Yeah, um, now yeah. Why, would, why would we want to do that? Well, if you, if you are maybe doing commercial work and stuff and you want to have a little exposure insurance, a little white balance insurance, basically if you need some flexibility, you will shoot raw files, but it, what it's better to do is get it right in camera. Even if you shoot raw or JPEG or both together, my motto is always do what you can in camera. And I'm going to talk about setting up all those other things as well. Excellent. 
If you shoot raw files, you can have you have a little leeway with exposure and white balance. That's basically the bottom line. Everything else you should stay the same. Okay, so has everybody got so right now you should be setting your cameras on the best quality settings. So whether it's super fine, fine or best, whatever it is on your camera. And if you have a Canon, you want to use it on that smooth setting. So you're picking size and quality. Everybody got that? Yep. Great. Okay, so the moral of the story, always use the best possible compression. And compression is a visible thing. Compression artifacts. I don't know, I'm going to zoom into this shot. I've got two JPEGs here. And one is, uh, the one on the left is uh, the best quality JPEG. And the one on the right, can you see the banding? In yeah. the sky? And can you see the artifacts around where the girl's jumping? Can you see it around her where the yeah, colors change. The blurry outline, basically. Yeah, it's kind of like, and if you could see it, I'm not sure if it'll be visible on the YouTube, but basically that shows compression artifacts. And what, what happens with JPEGs is if you look at the banding in the sky, it says, well, this blue is really similar to this blue down here. So we're going to take all the intermediate blues out and trash them because we want to save file size, right? So we compress, and when you compress, Images, you actually throw out information. You throw out color quality. And so that's why the moral of the story is always use the best quality. Because even if your file is small, you can always get a really good print out of it if the quality is good, no matter what size, unless it's like really internet size. Um, does that make sense, everyone? So yeah. it's, it's a visible uh, thing. Compression is visible. You always want to have the best quality because you will get artifacts. Now, you will also get those artifacts when you save your pictures, if you save them on Photoshop or any photo editing program. When you save photos and you save them as low-quality JPEGs, if you do it enough, your picture is going to look like this. It shows up mostly in, um, like, smooth gradations, this kind of banding. And if you don't have smooth gradations, you'll see it where the colors change. So you can see the sky and the girl's shirt here. There's a lot of fuzzy edge. Those are not pixels. Those are artifacts. Okay, so that's what compression looks like. <clears throat> All right, so we got that? Yep. Okay, let's move on. We're going to talk about ISO now. So ISO is one of the things that controls how bright your picture is, which we call exposure. So ISO, f-stops, and shutter speed control exposure. So ISO is the sensitivity of the camera sensor to light. Now, if anyone's old enough to have shot film in there, um, you'll remember that you used to have to buy ISO film for the different brightnesses of your scenes. <clears throat> so here's some examples. And the same is true for digital. If you are shooting in the bright sun, you want to use ISO 100 or 200. That's for really bright days. And if so you lower, are... Lower number for brighter light. Yes, lower number for brighter light. And if you go overcast or late in the day, 400 ISO is good. Or if you like to do window light portraits with natural window light, like in the room you're in now, you could probably use 400 ISO and get decent uh, window light portraits. So it looks nice and bright. Can you find your ISO button? I guess I shouldn't go so fast. Does everybody have their ISO button? Do we all have it? Yeah. You're good? I think we're all good to go. Excellent. Now, when people start out, they often just leave it on auto ISO because they're not really sure what to do there. And for beginners, I say, you know what, that's cool. Leave it on auto ISO. But after you get out of that beginner stage, you're going to realize that uh, just like f-stops and shutter speeds, ISO, it's kind of nice to understand it and choose the best one for the situation. Now, if you go to uh, night photos or indoor shots, indoor parties without flash, you probably will use 800 ISO or, or higher. And the thing to keep in mind about ISO as you increase your ISO, you increase noise. Now, noise is a little bit different than those artifacts we just looked at. Noise is kind of what we used to call in the film world, film grain. It kind of looks grainy. So what I suggest you do, and I'm going to show you what ISO looks like too. Set your ISO according to the shooting situation. So 400 is a good starting point, and you can go up or down from there. And you might need 
800 or 1600 indoors. The thing um, is that depending on the camera you have, you have to sort of what I call find your ISO tolerance. Because at some point, the camera you have will look really ugly at high ISO, depending right. on, yeah, like a small point and shoot. If you put that at 1600 ISO, it's going to look really ugly. My little uh, Lumix uh, LX5, I don't really sh like to shoot it over 400 ISO because to me it's too noisy. And when a photo is too noisy, you start to lose detail. And I'm going to just enlarge this picture. The one on the left is ISO 80 and the one on the right is ISO 1600. And you, s you notice noise in the dark areas. Now, I don't know if you can tell on your screen, but this one's really smooth on the left. And you can see that there's really good detail. But the one on the right you start to see the colors kind of break apart. They kind of get this, uh, I don't know, RGB kind of weird looking colory thing. And you also get like dotty things, noise patterns in the shadow here, just underneath this ball cap. Does that it make looks sense? like the old days when the TV had rabbit ears on it and you had to kind of fiddle yes. around. Yep. Yes. So, so that's what noise looks like. So what I tell people to do is for every camera, you're going to have sort of that tolerance level and you're going to, say, wow, I definitely don't want to shoot this camera over, like, say, it's 800 or 1600 ISO. So what I tell people to do is take uh, a bunch of pictures and just double your ISO every time. So start at 100, then go to 200, 4, 8, 16, 32, as high as your camera goes, and double that ISO every time. And then look at those photos uh, close up, like zoom into them 100%, either on your computer or on the back of the camera and say, okay, that noise is really gross, and I won't be using that ISO on this camera unless it's an emergency. And by emergency, I mean, you know, your, uh, your little brother's at the basketball game, and you need shots of him, and you, it's really low light, and you have to get the shots because you want to freeze the motion. I got to use 1600 ISO. That's the only way I'm going to get this shot because it's the finals, you know, and you have to get the shot. Then you use high ISO, but only in emergency is what I call it. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Cool. Yep. Okay, am I good so far? Are we going? Absolutely. Okay, next we're going to talk about white balance, which is the most often misunderstood, hardest to learn thing about digital photography. A lot of people think that cameras are really smart. Okay, I'll let you find your ISO button. I'll let everyone find their ISO menu. I mean, sorry, their white balance menu. Yep. Okay, so in the white balance menus, uh, you have what we call different color temperatures of light. And I'm sorry, I spelled color in the Canadian way there. Uh, we, we add weird letters in our language, just so you know. <laughs> we add extra well, letters like the Brits. We, we live in Buffalo and we watch a lot of hockey, so we're Oh, used to there it. you go. Yep. I used to live in Toronto, so we were, you know, neighbors once. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. So um, a lot of people think that, um, a lot of people, sorry, start off with automatic white balance. And automatic white balance, I would say, is wrong 80% of the time or 90% of the time, okay? Auto white balance really isn't very good to use because the cameras aren't really that smart. The camera doesn't know, oh, gee, there's fluorescent lights in this room. I think I'll, you know, figure that out and put it on fluorescent how white balance works, it actually gathers up color information from wherever you point your camera. So if you point your camera at something that has a lot of white, black, or gray, yeah, the white balance is going to be pretty good. But if you point your camera at something that's really colorful or one solid color, it's going to really throw things off because the cameras aren't that smart. They just read what's in the picture. They w do what we call the reflected reading of all the colors. And most people don't believe that, but you can actually do tests, and I will show you one in a second. So uh, just to give you a quick idea of what white balance is and what, you know, what, how it's measured, is it's measured in degrees Kelvin. And believe it or not, how they get those colors is they heat up a piece of metal, and when it goes to a certain temperature, it turns color. Oh, so wow. the, the white balance of a candle flame, is that big enough? Let me just see if I can just make this window a teeny bit bigger so that people can read yeah, that. Absolutely. We're cool? Yeah, we all got it. Okay. So um, uh, an incandescent light, like the old standard light bulbs, the color temperature is about 3,000 degrees Kelvin. Sunrise and sunset, 3,500. 
midday sun. So basically your average bright sunny day is around 5,500 degrees Kelvin. Now where I live, we're a bit of a higher altitude. <clears throat> I live near the mountains. So at high altitude, you get uh, UV light. You get a bit more UV light in the air and UV light is blue. It's cool. So sometimes on a clear sky, you can also have a higher white balance like 6,000 degrees Kelvin. In the shade, uh, white balance is usually cooler. So it would be bluer. The color of that light would be bluer. And if you ski at high altitudes like we do here, we ski sometimes at 10,000 feet above sea level. Or if you're flying in an airplane and you have the window seat and you look out the window, usually it looks a bit bluish. And it's not because the windows are tinted. It's because the atmosphere up high has a lot more ultraviolet light. So it's blue. So we have to compensate for all these colors of light. And then there's fluorescent lights and you know, uh, CFL lights and all kinds of crazy other kinds of lights that don't fit into the natural spectrum really. But a good place to start is if you're in daylight, you want to set your camera on a daylight white balance. Now I'm going to just go through, um, this is something that I already <clears throat> talked about. The cameras measure the color of light reflected from the scene. I've got a story to tell you. One of my first jobs, I was a corporate photographer and I was shooting all these executives from all over the world in for a board meeting and I was there three hours early, white backdrop is what they wanted. So I had my studio lights, my white backdrop, but silly me, I left the camera on auto white balance. So I took the pictures of all the guys and there was one woman and the guys were basically wearing black suits and white shirts and ties and you know, whatever. The white balance looked decent enough and I left it on auto white balance. <coughs> Then the woman came along with the red power suit. And guess oh. what? That white balance went crazy, okay? Because what happens is, what happened with the white balance, it tried to overcompensate for all the red in the picture. And as a consequence of that, it added cool colors. Because red is a warm color, it added all these cool colors. And her skin tone just went really awful looking, okay? She didn't, it didn't look very flattering to have blue skin. So. So that's when I realized, so that's when I realized that auto white balance sucks, okay? So, and what you can do is, what I say to people is, here's a, a thing you can do. Take a, a brightly colored towel or a sweatshirt or a blanket and put it in a daylight situation, like near a window or outside on a chair, and fill the whole screen of your picture and take a picture with auto white balance and then take a picture with daylight white balance. Okay, and you're going to see with your own eyes that when you have a large brightly colored area, your white balance, if you're using auto, is totally going to mess that up. So I mean like take a big green towel, like really bright colors. And why is this good to know? Well, if you photograph, say, a baby on a blanket, say you put the baby on green grass or a green blanket, and you take a picture of that baby using auto white balance, the skin tone of that baby is going to go really pink because it's trying to compensate for all that green. And I have a color wheel, I'll just, I'll just uh, show you that in a sec. So what I recommend instead of using auto is use the presets, okay? Now let's just have a little color lesson here. Um, we talked about these colors, which is the white balance, colors of light, and now we have the colors of photography. Oh, and just so you know, Scott, this presentation is on my website. Oh, awesome, which is okay. imagemaven.com, is yeah. that correct? So you can, yeah, you can give that out at the end, imagemaven.com, so people can review this and just, you know, they'll hear my voice in their head when they do so. So anyway, the colors of photography are red, green, and blue. So you can see I have RGB on this color wheel, and the opposite colors of RGB are cyan, magenta, yellow. Now, when you use auto white balance, here's what happens. Remember the lady in the red suit? Well, here she is. She's the red. So when you have auto white balance and what happens is the camera tries to automatically neutralize all those colors. So if it sees a lot of red, it throws in cyan and that's why her skin tone went cool because cyan is a cool color and cyan and red neutralize each other. Okay, here's another you example. Look at the character from Avatar. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and here is green. Here's our baby on the green blanket. Okay, here's green. And then what happens with auto white balance is magenta comes to the rescue and tries to neutralize all that green because it says, whoa, there's too much green in this picture. I've got to get rid of some of it. So that's why it's always better to use a preset. 
Now, if you have a sunset picture, sunset is kind of yellow and reddish, right? Sunset. So if you leave it on auto white balance, blue and cyan are going to come in and try to neutralize that color if you use auto. Okay, so I think everybody gets that, right? Yeah. So yellow, red, and magenta are called warm colors, and blue, cyan, and green are cool colors. So cool and warm will always neutralize or cancel each other out. Okay? So here's the thing. You've got to be smarter than the camera, okay? Because you are. So you've got to say, all right, guess what? I'm going to use a preset. It's sunny and it's daylight. I'm going to choose that sunny preset. So can you guys see your presets on your camera? Yep. Okay, great. So AWB is auto, and most people just leave it on that forever, and then at some point they're really not happy with their pictures and they want to know how to make them better. So this is a really easy way to get better color in your pictures is just by choosing the right, right white balance. Now, if, you, if it's an overcast day, you can pick cloudy. And if, it's, uh, if you're in tungsten light, so interior lights, sort of the traditional tungsten light bulbs, the regular light bulbs, mm -hmm. that is, so you can even see that this picture is blue. What it's like, it's like adding a filter to cancel out the yellow light. It will add blue. And remember our color wheel, blue and yellow are opposite. So having these presets is kind of like having a set of built-in color correction filters right in the camera. Now fluorescent is a bit tricky because right now we have many flavors of fluorescent. In your camera, some cameras, when you actually set the white balance, it actually tells you what the color temperature is. And you can customize that as well. You can customize the color temperature. If you buy a box of brand new fluorescent bulbs and it says cool white, then you know that it'll probably give you the color temperature on the box. It might say 6,000 degrees Kelvin. You can actually dial that into your camera. But most of the time we don't know, right? And fluorescent is a bit of what I call a crapshoot. You walk into a room, you're like, well, are these warm fluorescents? Are they cool? Are they daylight balanced? What the heck kind of fluorescents are these? So fluorescents, even though you have a setting on your white balance in your camera that says fluorescent, it may not be 100% accurate. So that's just a little keep that in mind. Um, another thing is a uh, flash. If you use the flash, the camera usually automatically throws it into flash white balance. And flash is very similar to daylight. It's just usually a little bit warmer. It adds a little bit of a warm warmth to it. Now this camera here, I don't know if you can see this, but it has a fish. So it has like an underwater setting. It's like, well, is that underwater in my swimming pool? Or is that underwater in the ocean? You know, so it, again, you have to kind of, this is one of those cases where you read the manual as needed. You know, it's like, what exactly is underwater? So does anyone have any questions about white balance? It's kind of tricky. Are they just silent or have I scared no, them? No, everybody's <laughs> nodding yes. So okay. Everybody's getting it. I just think this is one of those things that obviously when you do it a few times, it yeah. becomes a little more natural. Yeah. So here's some examples of, of white balance, okay? So this was an interior of a church set to a daylight white balance. So you can see that it's quite warm because the lighting in there is kind of like tungsten lighting. So when you use daylight white balance in a tungsten lighting situation, it'll make it warm. It'll really warm up the scene. Yeah. Now in the, in the next photo, I've actually totally neutralized it and I've used like more like a candle white balance. But what's happened here, it's almost gotten too cool. We've, yeah. lost, we've lost the feeling of a church. Now it's a cold church. We want our churches to look warm and inviting. So in this third photo, I've used a tungsten white balance. It's still a little bit warm because these lights are probably a little bit warmer than tungsten. They're a little bit, you know, they're probably 2800 Kelvin or something. It's still warm. It still looks like a nice warm church, but it's not as warm or orangey as this one. This was our yeah. first one. See, totally orangey. And this was our second and this was our third. So if you're not happy with your white balance, you can just choose another preset and see if it helps as well. Okay, here's another example. This was on auto white balance. You know what? That looks pretty decent. This is close to my house. I live near, uh, near Banff National Park, and we go there for lunch. You know, it's close. And this was decent. It was late in the day, and in the fall, you can see that it's, you know, not, there's no green grass here. So, but you know what? It's cool. In auto white balance, here's daylight. See how much nicer that looks? 
So when the sun is setting, when the sun is setting, if you want to keep the warmth of a low light, you know, late in the day warmth, then use daylight white balance. I'm going to go back to the auto and you're going to see, shockingly, how cool that looks now. See how cold that looks? Yeah. So here's daylight. So when the daylight, it looks warm because it was a warm scene. The light was warm. But here's auto. So auto neutralized all that yellow. Okay? It neutralized the yellow. And just for fun, if you want to see what tungsten looks like in daylight, there's tungsten. So it adds a lot of blue. It's like adding a blue filter. Yeah, it looks very Star Trek. Yes, it's very Star Trek. So you probably wouldn't use that too often unless you just like had no ideas and, oh, well, I guess I'll just throw a big blue filter on everything. So, But that's what it should be. That's more natural looking and that's more how I remembered it. Yeah, it's beautiful. So the tip is if you're shooting sunsets, if you want to keep the warmth or anything warm late in the day shots, use a daylight white balance just to keep the warmth. All right, here's another example of two different white balances. Okay, so here's 3300. So that's a tungsten white balance. And here's a daylight white balance. So you can see that it's like adding colored filters to your photos. That's literally night and day. Yes. Yeah. So if something doesn't quite look right with, your, with the color of your photo, check your white balance. Check your white balance. All right, everybody with me? Yeah. yeah. All right. So this is what I just said. Use a daylight white balance to get warmer colors. Okay, the last, uh, one of the last things I'm going to talk here about is uh, the histogram. Now I have a motto. The histogram is your friend. Okay? The histogram is your friend. So the histogram is a, it's a graphical representation of the brightness of your photo. So what the heck does that mean? If you, if you actually look at your camera and look at some of the photos that you've taken previously and bring up the histogram, you might have to um, go into, well, you go into playback mode and some cameras you push the display button, some you push the info button. It just depends on the camera model. But you want to bring up the histogram display. And it's just, yeah, does everybody find that okay? You're good? Yep. Okay. So I'm going to go back to the histogram picture here. And just to let you know, the left side of the histogram, if you look at my diagram, shows the, what we call the shadows, the dark parts of the photo. And the middle section is what we call the midtones, makes sense. And the very right side of the histogram is what we call the highlights. It's everything that's bright. So I'm gonna here's a couple of examples of some photos with histograms. And you can see that your histogram usually goes, you know, across and it has peaks and valleys. Okay? You don't really have to worry about how high your histogram goes. The deal is you want it to go all the way across. Okay? You want it to go all the way across. Now, if you edit your photos, you will also see histograms. So here's a photo in Photoshop with a histogram corresponding. All right? And you can see that this photo has got a really high peak in it. And that's because there's a lot of that one color. And it's probably the blue sky and the brown building here. Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this histogram goes all the way across. Okay? But this histogram doesn't okay it's underexposed and you can see that this photo is dark and also the histogram is what we call climbing the walls on the left side because you know sometimes you can't trust the back of your camera in fact most of the time you can't trust the back of your camera you, you always I always double check the histogram uh, as a backup to see if my photo is properly exposed alright now this next photo showing overexposure so now it's climbing the wall at the right side of the histogram. So that means there's too much light. Okay? Now when you shoot JPEGs, if you overexpose, like this photo, that means that those details in this building here are gone. When you overexpose JPEGs, you can't get your uh, highlights back. We call those the highlights. We can't bring those back into a usable range. Okay, so it's really important that your histogram goes all the way across but doesn't climb the walls, especially on the right side. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. Okay, 
Did everybody else do? We're good? Yep. Okay. All right. So you've got this histogram. So what do you do? What do you do if it's not the way it should be? Okay? And this is really key. And every camera pretty much can do this. Even if you don't know anything about f-stops and shutter speeds. If your histogram is, if your picture is too bright or too dark, you can do what we call exposure compensation. Now on your camera, so basically you take a photo, you check the histogram, and you're like, okay, too bright. If it's too bright, you take away light. Okay, if your picture is overexposed, you take away light. So you can minus, and I'll show you some more details later. And if it's too dark, you can add light. So we have, every camera has a plus minus button. Now you have to get into picture taking mode, so activate your meter, just press your shutter button down part way. And you should have a plus minus button somewhere on your camera. And in this camera, I have a picture of a camera here. It looks like this. It's plus oh, minus. OK? Sometimes it's a little bit hard to find. You well, got this it? Is cool, Marlene. This is good? Yeah. OK. So if your picture is too bright, you take out light. And, and depending on the camera and the dials, what you do is you move the scale, because it goes minus two to plus two, you can take, you can move that little knob to the left to minus one, if your picture's too bright, take another photo and see what it looks like. But most of the time our pictures are too, too uh, dark, especially in the snow. Do you guys have snow in Buffalo right now? <clears throat> it's melting, but yeah, we do have a little bit left. Yeah. What ha here's, a, here's a little trick about getting white snow in your picture. If, you're, if your histogram, if you take a photo in the snow and it looks kind of gray, you know how you get gray snow? Oh, yeah. Well, all you got to do is plus one or plus two on your exposure compensation and you will make that snow white. Okay? You will turn the snow white. Because basically, when there's too much white in the picture, the meter says, oh, well, we got so much light in here, I've got to take some out. I've got to take some out. So, and here's another scale of a uh, exposure compensation dial on a Canon, I think this is a Canon 20D or something. So anyway, so that would be something, if you can't find that, that dial on your camera, that plus minus, that'd be something to look up. But it's the easiest way to get really good exposure on your camera, even if you know nothing about f-stops and shutter speeds. So if you're really in the beginner stages, by the way, video cameras work the same way. And often when we put people against a light wall, like a light yellow or a, or a white wall, the wall doesn't turn out white, it turns out gray. So in order to make it white, you just add light. So you just flip this over to plus one and sometimes even plus two and you will get your white wall and also the skin tone of the person will be also properly exposed. As long as your histogram isn't climbing the right side. That's right. So you, basically right. my rule is as far to the right as possible without climbing the walls. Okay, as far to the right without climbing the walls. Now there are some situations where the histogram will be spiking and that is if, for instance, if uh, it's a really you're at the beach and there's glistening water or you're at a, like a car show, a show and shine or something and there's chrome bumpers, you will get spikes on the histogram at the right side. You will get spikes. But you just kind of have to uh, take into account where they are. If it's the top of Scott's head that's, uh, you know, spiking, then you know you've that got a problem. problem. Now. Some cameras show you overexposure when you play back your pictures and part of your preview there will be blinking. Does anyone have that on their cameras? What I call them the blinkies. So after you take your picture, when you're scrolling through the, the review, if the parts of the photos are blinking, those are overexposed. I think I've seen that before and that area sometimes is highlighted too. Yes, yes. Right. And, gotcha. and, in, and in some cameras, the underexposed areas also blink. Okay. okay. So, but it's always good to check out your histogram, and if you see the blinking areas, you can look at, well, what's blinking? You know, if it's, the, if it's a sunset, of course, the sunset will probably be blinking because that just means that some of that picture is overexposed. Now, some cameras have three histograms, okay? So we have this thing. Some cameras have a red, green, and blue histogram, but these uh, samples here are just showing the, the one histogram. Does anyone have three histograms on, their, on the back of their camera? 
A lot of the new cameras, they'll show you three histograms. But that's oh, basically... Yes. Yeah. Go, ahead. Go ahead, Marlene. Well, the, that's what I mean by the histogram is your friend, because that's sort of telling you if your photo is properly exposed, and this is your chance to fix it. So, does any, did you have a question, Scott? Oh, not at all. I was just fiddling around with my histogram, and it works like a charm. Good. Now, okay. So I wasn't really in the habit of using. Yeah, well, you know what? And for video, it's great, okay, yeah. as well. So when you're shooting your hybrid products, you want to have a really good-looking histogram because it's harder to fix video. It's a, you know, it's really easy to fix photos. Uh, and, and, but even though I say get it right in the camera, so if your histogram is good, your white balance is good, you've got a really good start to your photo. Okay, so that's basically get it right in camera, and those things are key: the color and the exposure. And you control those with the white balance and the histogram using exposure compensation if necessary. All right. Does anyone have any questions? Anybody? Anything? I think you did a great job here. They're all nodding and smiling that they oh, got geez. it. Either that so, or they're just like, whoa, too much information. No, no, I mean, people are scribbling away notes. The one thing I think I want to know a little bit more about, though, and you really do a great job on this, is we're talking about the bouquet, like we were talking about earlier. Oh, yes. How to, how to get those professional-looking pictures with the okay. shallow depth of field and the blurry backgrounds. All right, so bouquet, I'm going to go back to my mode dial here for bouquet. So if you want to get bouquet shots, so this might be a little bit more advanced for some of you. Uh, let me just see if I've got uh, an f-stop thing in this presentation. Let me just see. Now let me ask you a real quick question while you're, you're looking at that presentation. You know, a lot of people will say, well, you got to have one of those big DSLRs with a huge sensor in order to get the shallow depth of field. Oh, no. no. Is that true? No, this is not true. Bokeh is basically means blur. Okay, so anything that's blurry is bokeh. But what we think of bokeh are those, like, blobs, you know, those blobs of color? And how you get those is three things. It's shallow depth of field, okay? Shallow depth of field means not a lot of your pictures in focus. Depth of field basically means depth of focus. So when you have shallow depth of field or shallow focus, you're going to get blur in the background. And how you do that is three things. You can use a large aperture, so f2.8 or f4, whatever your camera goes to, the widest lens opening. If you use a telephoto lens, so a long focal length lens, so if you have a zoom, you zoom out. And if you're close to your subject, you get more chance of getting bokeh. So here's an example. You do a portrait of somebody, and you zoom in, and you're like three feet away from them, and you shoot it at f2.8 or f4, you're going to probably get bokeh in the background. Now, bokeh, to get those blobs, though, you've got to have some light, like um, Christmas lights were great, yeah. or street lights. If you're shooting at night, it's really easy to get bokeh at night because at night you definitely have a huge aperture, right, mm -hmm. And because it's dark. And if you want to play with, like, if you, you could actually shoot bokeh probably today where you are by using these three things, a big aperture, so put it on aperture priority, put your camera on Whatever your biggest f-stop is, most cameras, it's like f4 or f2.8 these days. So Somewhere that, that. Ironically, though, just kind of like, like exposure, the smaller number is the bigger aperture, right? Yeah, well, it's, be okay. it's because f-stop is actually a measure of focal length over the diameter of the aperture. That's a little bit mathy. But so it's a fraction. If, if, if your focal length is, is 50 millimeters, your yep. 50 millimeter lens, and your aperture is 25 millimeters big, that is f2. 50 yeah. divided by 25 is f2. So, and if you if you make that number smaller, that diameter smaller, that f-stop gets bigger. The f-stop number gets bigger, but the actual f-stop is is what we call a large aperture. Actually, has a small number, and that's just something you just got to commit to memory. <laughs> okay. It's hard to understand, but I have some uh, blog posts on my website about about that as well. So. Which again is imagemaven.com. Yeah, imagemaven.com. And I have um, I have some like uh, a freebie e-course that covers a lot of the stuff that I talked about uh, in in today's uh, little video here in today's lesson. So if people are interested in that, they can have a look at that, and they'll get like a review of all these lessons. Awesome. As well. So uh, bouquet. Any other question about that? 
So you could actually do that with each other. The key to get those blobs of color though is you need some highlights in the background. You need something that's reflecting light. Excellent. Well, I think what we're going to do then is, again, in the off weeks here, we go out and we take some photographs. So Great. all this week and then next week we're going to get together for a photo outing. We want to apply some of the lessons you've taught us today, Marlene. We really thank you so much for spending time with us. Great. And for sharing the information. Guys, this was phenomenal, wasn't it? Awesome. Let's hear from Marlene. Great. And again, if you want to learn more from Marlene Helema, just go to imagemaven.com, and she's also one of the hybrid heroes on discovermirrorless.com, and we're working on a lot of fun projects together. So again, thank you, Marlene, for joining us today. You're welcome, Fantastic. Scott. Fantastic.